and Sarun. What's uh, so it actually be uh, three of my students joining oh, me? We only good. knew of one uh, coming when I had to register for this. Okay, so um, I stand between two um, uh, keynote speakers on uh, on AI and technology. Um, and I'm very glad that they kind of set the stage, um, Joanna um, and Victoria, this morning um, on the uh, difficulties and hopes here. Uh, so I want to discuss the idea of could we use language models responsibly? Or as we'll see, can we redeem the stochastic parrots? Um, so I opened up my Gmail this a uh, couple months ago and it offered this new feature, the um, uh, being able to write re, uh, a, any kind of email you want, just describe what you want, and click the create button, and it out pops. Well, here's a glowing review for my team member. So uh, you read this whole bunch of things. Um, you probably can't read it from where you are, but that's just fine because by definition, it contains no information. Uh, of course, okay, it has a couple of little blanks, team member name in brackets, technical skills in brackets, uh, but really it's not conveying anything to the person who's reading it. Oh wait, so there's going to be a person who I'm writing this email to who now has to digest this whole pile of uh, words. Um, <laughs> how is that helping them? To make matters worse, I can even go down and elaborate <laughs> at even more. <laughs> Useless information. Uh, so, and, and this is the direction that Google, Microsoft, other technology companies are pushing these things. Just generate more stuff for you. Be more productive. Is that what we want? So, outline of this talk. Um, first of all, how do these language models work? They work by exploiting God's good design. I mean exploit in both senses. Um, but we're misusing them. Uh, so here is where I'm referencing uh, Joanna's talk, um, where we're uh, all the ways that we don't use AI right. But remember the arc of the biblical narrative, creation, fall, redemption, new creation. Are there ways that we can use these things redemptively? What might values and visions for that look like? And how do we get there? For how do we get there? I'll invite my students to come um, and join us there. Um, so just to be, come to the punchline, um, Current applications of AI emphasize this productivity. What if we emphasize love instead? They give us invisible nudges in certain directions. What if instead they helped us be more aware of what we were communicating? They devalue truth, but what if they could help us value truth and integrity? And current approaches overall center the AI, the agent, the chatbot. What if we could center people? So you can leave now. This is the main point. But um, basically, language models exploit God's good design. So language models, or large language models, LLMs, they work because of how God made the world. So we see on Genesis 1 and 2 that God speaks language, uh, let there be light, but into a community. Let's make man in our own image, a speaker, a person who can say and hear and name things. Uh, and that is exactly the source of the training data that these language models are using. Language that we're speaking to each other. Um, overall, um, we've seen how the uh, dependable rules and predictable patterns in the universe bring to this wondrous diversity of um, human biological and natural and uh, social experience. And language is a great example of that. Simple rules. Um, put, okay, maybe linguists will argue that they're not that simple. Um, <laughs> but learnable by children. And yet, we can create masterpieces. And finally, um, God revealed himself as a word, saying there's something special about language. Language does something. And the large language models, ChatGPT, all these other things we're seeing now, work because they're aligning in some way with this way that God made the world. So as a brief little illustration, let's see, what if we wanted to try to predict this word in, uh, that I covered up and just left as a blank? Any idea what's there? No. Okay, what if I tell you that it follows A? Okay, now you know that it's a, probably a noun, maybe starts with a consonant sound. These are clues that the context is giving us. As we add more context, we get a better idea. Maybe it's about a location. Um, 
Maybe, oh, hmm. So here's a couple words, a couple lines above. It's goat. So maybe it's something that rhymes with that. So it ends with a oat sound, but maybe not goat because it's lame to rhyme something with it. So, uh, hmm. uh, so I, now, what could, would you, could you on a, hmm, I think people are starting to guess what this might be. So the more context I give you, the better you can make a guess as to which word goes in there. So, um, Indeed, this is from my kid's copy of Green Eggs and Ham. Um, it's a children's book. And um, would you, could you on a boat? Um, now, of course, when you're first reading this as a child or as a language model being trained, um, you might make a mistake and say, would you, could you on a horse? Um, well, mm, it kind of, it's a noun, it's... Uh, kind of this uh, contextually the same kind of a thing as a goat. They show up together in farm animal books all the time, but no. So how do we fix this? We can adjust the representation of boat. So boat should match that context better. Horse should not belong in that context as much. And maybe we just can even learn about these contexts, like the ends with oat context. Um, maybe we weren't sure about the difference between the rhyming relationship and the contextually related relationship. This example is helping us tease those apart to make a distinction among things that were otherwise similar. Uh, so this is basically how the language model works. Um, but it, in the end, it's just math. We give it a document, interrupted, partway through, output, next word. So you just repeatedly try to predict every word in a document um, and then uncover one more word, predict the next one. Uh, in blue, I give the technical details. Basically, we're giving a discrete probability distribution over possible tokens, which could be words or whole partial words or punctuation things to characters. Um, and uh, the output is, oh, for all possible words, all possible next tokens, how surprised would we be by that being the next token? In the horse or boat example, um, we should be unsurprised seeing boat. We would be very surprised. We should be very surprised if we saw cow. On a cow? What? Um, so um, in math terms, it's a factored joint probability distribution. We want to say, how probable is this sequence of tokens? And we just say, what's the probability of the first one times the probability of the second one given the first one, and so on. A language model is technically a learnable program that computes that probability distribution. So training a language model, you just reveal the internet one word at a time and minimize surprise. A whole lot of technical details went into that statement. Um, but <laughs> um, we train a categorical cross entropy loss. I can come back and give you any more de technical details of this later. But basically, um, this is a genius idea. In order to improve performance at this task, models end up learning about spelling, common phrases, subject and verb agreement, rhyming, summarizing, standard structures like the five paragraph essay, lots of things about programming because there's lots of code on the internet, uh, different viewpoints. If you can recognize that an article was written by a conspiracy theorist um, starting off, then you might have a better prediction for what the next word that they're going to say next is. So you get all those kind of things for better or worse and all the stereotypes, gender, race, religion, anything else that you can express in writing all gets built into this probability of current word given previous words. Um, so this is a really good idea um, because we get lots of training data, trillions of tokens on the internet. Um, you don't need to label anything, but maybe you want to do some curation because you don't want to necessarily learn from everything on the internet. There's a wide range of tasks that are just embodied into this next word prediction. There's some diversity in examples. Of course, maybe there should be more diversity in examples because most Internet text is uh, leans um, English, American, uh, affluent, sort of bias. But broad, compared with other examples, it's sure a lot more diverse ways to go on there. Um, so transformers are sometimes, these, the models underlying these things are sometimes blamed as being like just re regurgitating things. Um, but actually, it's a powerful computational architecture. Um, so it's a really unusual one, and I can talk more about this later if you're into these kind of things. Um, and maybe it does in, uh, initially start memorizing this training data, but later it actually learns to do the computation that you need to do um, because computing is more compact than lookup. Um, so more training data just gives more test cases for these little programs it's learning. Um, you can think of this as a computational architecture. It's running on a computer. Here's the simulator for that computer. It's only like, you know, 50, 60 lines of code. 
Um, I can unpack that for you later if you want. But the idea is that this is just hardware. What the, where the magic is, if there is any magic, is all in the software. We don't know very much about how the software works. Um, it's slowly getting better, but there's huge opportunities for research here. Uh, if you're a, uh, a student or advising students coming up, in, interpretability research on these language models is a pretty fruitful area. Not one that I'm in, but I would encourage you to go there. Uh, so that's the section of just um, how these things work. Um, now onto the specifics of where I'm going. So we're, I think these are really cool technologies, but we're misusing them. Uh, so there's a, a paper um, a couple years ago by some people. Uh, two of these authors um, were at Google and are no longer. Tim Gabriel and Margaret Mitchell, who had to hide her name. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, they were trying to argue, even before ChatGPT, before it got um, popular to be thinking about these things, they were already arguing that um, these language models just had the superficial appearance of stitching together uh, plausible sequences of linguistic stuff, but doesn't actually have any meaning. Like a parrot can say something appropriate in the context, but doesn't actually know what it's talking about. Um, and one of the authors, Emily Bender, later um, published this uh, uh, article in New York Magazine, arguing basically that um, one of the principles behind uh, the acceptance of these parrots and chatbots is that we're devaluing ourselves to the point of only thinking of our, the skills that we have that can be parroted as valuable. We're reducing our own cognitive abilities, or the, at least the abilities that we value, to the sort of things that are just like being able to write a prompt and respond to it. And then is it really any surprise that we start worrying about the chatbot taking over our work or, or our students using uh, chat GPT to generate essays if all we're re thinking about is just this um, prompt response um, uh, input output it's a real flattening of human experience um, so sin and predictive text um, this is some things that I've studied in my dissertation work um, I looked at how the smartphone keyboards that we can uh, that we all use do um, affect what we write um, so we get lazy communication, like a single box it is, we can insert, thank you so much, which is a keystroke, a single tap. Um, and focusing on self-centeredness, what's easy for me to say instead of thinking about the reader? Overall, we get this idea of cognitive interference. Uh, so here's a, a study that I did. Um, I had people do an image captioning task. Um, I gave them 12 different images, asked them to write a caption on it, and um, I just turned the suggestions on or off. Um, so the participants did this a bunch of times, sometimes with suggestions, sometimes with suggestions that were sometimes on, sometimes with no suggestions. And um, overall, um, we saw that people writing with the suggestions wrote captions that were shorter and had fewer unexpected words. So it was just less informative. And uh, we think the interpretation of what was going on here is that um, instead of thinking about what would be helpful to say, you see a prediction of a word in front of you and you just say, oh, that's good enough, tap. Um, so maybe that's just on the single word level, um, but we also looked at um, the kind of sentiment bias um, that these systems might have. They overall have a positive bias, um, but I'll, I'll just highlight this. Uh, I did some work in this, but then my study was later replicated by much better by some uh, other researchers in Germany. Um, uh, and basically, it is found that uh, they asked people to write about their opinions about social media, and one system was giving positively slanted suggestions. Social media is good for people. Other people, other system was giving negative slanted suggestions, and it affected what they wrote and what opinion they stated afterwards that they had about the issue. So these systems are nudging us. Are chatbots any better? Well, they give this false sense of confidence because remember, this system was trained to be believable, not to be accurate or right. Um, it, they, they give this kind of anthro anthropomorphic mirage of I am, am happy to do that for you kind of thing. Um, and they hide a lot of human labor. Uh, so just ch the change from predictive text, like your phone, to chatbots didn't really improve anything. 
Um, so is this, should we just abandon these things altogether? Um, well, maybe some uses we should, but maybe there are some ways that we can take this sort of raw material and what would it look like in the new creation? Um, so are the parrots redeemable? Predictive text, that interaction can tell some other stories from my uh, research attempts. It's going to be hard to take that in, that interaction where it's just telling you a word to enter or a whole phrase or a uh, whole essay and just saying, are you going to accept this? That kind of interaction is going to be hard to redeem. But lots of other kinds of interactions are possible. Uh, so what values, before we start actually designing those interactions, what values might we want to put in there? Maybe we want to have loving your neighbor be more important than generating copy or content. Uh, maybe we want truth to be more important than exuding confidence. Maybe we want integrity to overwhelm efficiency. Maybe we want to put people, humans, and the authority to individually and collectively decide how these things are going to work and how they're going to affect our communication systems instead of just having black boxes that you talk to. Maybe we can even use them to practice understanding across differences. Uh, so I'll skip these here to be able to make sure we have enough time for my students to talk about um, a few things that we're starting to explore about how to do this. Uh, so this is actually a, a, a summer research project that um, actually some students last year got us start on, started on, and then I've got seven students working with me this summer, and well, we're exploring um, some add-ins to Word to try this out. Uh, the people in bold, um, Ray, Noel, and Saron, are here in person, if you all would want to uh, come down. Uh, and there's also uh, Jiho, Idam, Sophia, uh, so I had this summer and many others from the past. Yeah, so hi, I'm Noelle Haviland. Uh, Rick Lindman. And I'm Saron Melese. And as Professor Arnold said, we are students from Calvin University that have been working on this research project this summer that addresses some of the ideas mentioned in this presentation. So the purpose of our project is to be able to build a tool where a writer can give a language model, a piece of writing, and have it give thought-provoking reflections that are intended to help the writer think critically when they're creating and revising their work. With our project, we are focused mainly on the revision process. Our tool is not intended in any way to tell writers what to say. Rather, it is intended to help them make the best writing that they possibly can by getting them to think about it more. So this is an image of what our interface actually looks like. And as you can see, first, uh, writers will select the type of feedback that they would like to receive. There are several different types. Uh, we have advice, we have summary, we have reflections, etc. And the corresponding prompt to that is actually what's given to the AI models. For example, on this slide, the writer has asked for a summary of what the AI thinks that the thesis of each paragraph is. And the prompt at the top is what the user would actually see when they're interacting with our system. However, uh, the AI will sometimes need some more detail when you ask it a question in order to produce the most accurate and desirable information. So at the bottom of the slide, you can see the prompt that the model itself would actually receive with the instructions explicitly of what it's supposed to do. And as you can see there, if the user were to hover over one of the reflections, then our system would then turn the corresponding paragraph to be highlighted in yellow so that you can see what exactly it's reflecting on. And if the user finds a reaction to be particularly helpful and maybe want to give it some more thought later, they have the ability to click on that pin and then that reflection will appear in the Word document as a comment, an anchored comment. But importantly, in order to help the author maintain ownership of their ideas and voice, our system does not insert any text into the actual document itself. That is the job of the writer once they have had some time to kind of think over what they have seen. All right. Uh, so overall, uh, we're trying to repurpose existing technologies for better use. We leverage the pre-trained models, the OpenAI APIs, for example. Um, 
but I'm actually wanting your input. Should we be using this, the flawed technology of the open AI APIs, even to, as part of envisioning better tech, um, even though it, we have issues about how it's trained and such. But overall, the takeaway, should background the AI, no chatbot agents, foreground people. Um, let's design human systems towards human flourishing. Um, use AI, including these language models, as tools. Let's build tools, not agents. Uh, like, don't personify things. I wish chatbots would never have used the word I, because it just misleads people. And I think there's a huge realm of opportunity in designing user interfaces, writer experiences, interfaces for people, rather than just trying to make the AIs better. So that's your takeaway. Um, happy to take questions. So, I'll need the mic. So are you um, are you modifying? Are you doing additional training of the um, of like ChatGPT or whichever model you're using? Are you doing any filtering in the output, or you're just prompting it for revision type questions and just filtering that way? Uh, so far, we're just using the existing model as it is. Uh, we've been surprised at the amount of different kinds of capabilities. But really, maybe we shouldn't have been surprised because people have been helping each other revise their documents in public on the internet for a lot of ways. So it's really just being thankful to all the people whose work has created all these possible possibilities. But as we think about moving towards open source models, we are also collecting data about what writers actually find helpful and are going to think about how to use that responsibly, maybe, to, um, <laughs> to improve open source systems for this. I've never used one of these, so it's yet to be an experience for me. But my question is, in this um, model you developed, it's intended to give the writer suggestions for reflection or improvement. Can that person take the suggestions given and um, do a control C and copy it and just paste it into any document? Uh, so the question was, can the writer just copy the suggestion? And yes, um, so uh, we could do that. In fact, uh, there was a previous study that we were inspired by that um, gave summaries of what you wrote, um, and they explicitly gave the writer the possibility to copy and paste because sometimes writers appreciated the way that somebody else, or in this case, a AI system summarized what they wrote, like, oh, you said it better than I did. And sometimes when you're writing, we find that idea. But we shied away from that because we really just want to keep all the writer's voice in there. There's going to be um, uh, lots of policies, I'm sure, coming out about whether it's okay to use generative AI in publications. Uh, like, is it okay to use this as part of writing a book? If not all of those words are actually your authors. We want to make sure that whatever, uh, that when people are using our system, that there's just going to be no question. Of course, this is your work. Of course, these are your words. Um, have you interacted or collaborated, say, with your English department or your English composition professors as you've been, uh, or writing center, as you've been developing this? And what have those interactions been like? Wonderful question. Uh, thank you. Um, we have been trying to, um, but approaching this delicately um, because our English department is a little skeptical of technology overall. Rightly so, I think. Um, one step at a time. Um, yeah, I was wondering if each of the students could just comment a little bit on what they've individually contributed to the project. And then second, from, a, from like a collaboration standpoint, have you put this on, on GitHub or anywhere? Is there some sort of data product that writers can download and start trying out? Yeah, so uh, I've been mainly working on the technical side, um, yeah, creating the UI and the um, Office add-in, as well as um, working with the back-end and NLP approach. So I've mainly been working with uh, kind of researching into writing theory and also designing the study that we're going to be doing in the coming days actually to test this thing that we've built. And I'll also be analyzing the data from that study once it's complete. Um, and I've been working on prompt foo, testing prompts, and also on the UI UX design. And all of them, especially the ones who are not represented here, have been helpful in helping the scope and figure out what in the world we're doing by asking those great questions, what are we doing? Yeah.
Let's thank the number.